Hey, Dr. Brooke here, the crypto proctor, hanging out with my co-pilot today, Lars Emmerich. He is the number one best-selling author of the Sam Jamison and Peter Kittredge Conspiracy Theory series, read by over 1 million thriller fans. Lars is an entrepreneur, investor, Bitcoin miner, and retired F-16 pilot who writes about good guys with a bad streak and bad guys with a few redeeming qualities. A 1994 distinguished graduate of the Air Force U.S. Air Force Academy, a Hertz Fellow, and a two-time recipient of the Distinguished Flying Cross Medal in Valor in Combat, Lars brings a unique perspective to any discussion about literature, economics, and geopolitics. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Welcome to the show, Lars. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Honor and a pleasure. I appreciate it. Yes, absolutely. And like most of my listeners know already, my first question for all of my co-pilots is, tell us about your Web3 journey. How did you get here? How did you become a Bitcoin miner to begin with? Yeah, so this was actually long before anybody was saying words like Web3. Uh, this was probably 2012 maybe 2011 so the very Bitcoin, early on yeah uh, not it was it was before it was a, a huge thing it was already something of a thing i guess it's yeah. about two and a half or three years after the white paper but i was yeah. thinking a lot about about value and how do you store it because if you have money you put that someplace they charge you fees to hold it for you even though it's ones and zeros on a website these days mm -hmm. and then if if you Ignore it for too long, you realize it's got, well, it's got half the purchasing power it used to have. And I thought that was generally a bad deal overall. And it's like, what the hell do you do? And um, obviously, people talk about gold, but the trouble with gold is it's tough to carry that around and it's tough to transact with it. And so I was, um, I was spinning around, what do I invest in? Uh, where, do I, where do I store value? Stocks? Okay, but most stocks actually go to zero, <laughs> no matter what they tell you about the index. Oh, the index, it's great. It's flying high, better than ever. Yeah, most of those stocks that have ever been are not in existence anymore. And when I, I don't even know how I stumbled upon this, but I uh, read the premise about Bitcoin mm -hmm. and it clicked in my brain. You don't, this, this solves all the stuff that's wrong with fiat and it solves all the stuff that's wrong with gold. And so I think this could be something. And uh, so then I, it, it took me probably a few more months to figure out am I high, am I smoking dope? Is, am I crazy? Like, what do I know about this stuff? I have no background in this. What kind of a lunatic would invest in it at this point? It's just a bunch of nerds talking in chat rooms and stuff. But I was like, the idea is so compelling, man. This, is, this could actually change the way people relate to each other it could change the way people do business all over the globe it could it could really solve a lot of the oppression problems that we we seem to be having for the last call it century or so and uh and so i i debated do i do i get on an exchange someplace and give them my information and buy some bitcoin or do i nerd out a little bit and do the minor thing so that's when I became a Bitcoin miner. I, we, you know, we took the plunge, wired some money offshore to some <laughs> company. I'm like, holy smokes. Not Whatever sketchy is, at all. Not sketchy at all. It's hardly sketchy at all. 100% <laughs> confidence. It's going to totally work out, love. Don't worry about it. Right, tell my, right. Tell my wife. Uh, but she's like, I'm, I trust you. What's good? Oh, my God. That really put the pressure on because then I was like, oh, man, you know, what if this is a complete, yeah. a complete lark? <laughs> but um, I, I did the thing for a while where I was I was weighing the utility bill against the oh, cost, yeah. the, the the value of the Bitcoin that I was yes. getting. And so I was like, oh, no, we lost 100 bucks this month. <laughs> 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 we really, really meant to like 12 coins or something like that, you know, and, and uh, at the time you couldn't you couldn't yeah. buy a smile with it. But right. Uh, <laughs> but I, but I just believed in it, and I was like, "No, I think this is something." So I held on, and I held on, and I held on, and we woke up one day, and we're like, "Holy smokes, this is <laughs> this is something pretty cool now," you know. So I, I don't mine anymore. It's obvious for obvious reasons. I yeah. don't live in like Kazakhstan or <laughs> someplace like that, and uh, and it's just too expensive and and too hard to to stay on top of it 
as a as a middle aged goofball who just likes do, the do idea. You still, do you still have your your holding the coins that you did mine? Do you still are you holding those? Yeah. So we nice. um, we cashed oh. in. We cashed in a, a, a portion of them. Yeah. To uh, like you know we're not getting any younger. And it'd be silly to be 75, shriveled up, sitting around looking at a spreadsheet going, man, we could have taken some trips or done something with all this money. Yeah. So, yeah, we we, um, cool. we treated ourselves a little bit, but we held on to a bunch of a bunch of coins as well. So Very cool. I love that story. That's so fun. <laughs> yeah. Like, good for you. Like, I don't even know. Like you said, you're like, I don't know how I stumbled upon this. So that I'm like, man, if only I was you in, in 2012. <laughs> Yeah, I think I was actually uh, slacking off at work. I was just surfing the <laughs> surfing the web on the on like a government computer or something. You're like in the dark webs. Like, what is this Bitcoin? <laughs> Go to the heroin or buy some Bitcoin. I don't know. What one am I gonna do here? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's funny. What a great story. Very cool, Lars. Uh, I wanna I wanna link back to something you had just said in that story. You said Bitcoin was something you discovered was a solution to what's wrong with fiat. Now, this is something I share with a lot of my listeners. I talk about fiat. I talk about Federal Reserve, how the United States doesn't have their own dollar. We work with the Federal Reserve now and so on. But can you just maybe like talk about two or three different things that you see as wrong with fiat? Mm, yeah. I, so um, I should start by saying that, you know, I've been, I've been tough on fiat over the years, but then I was like, okay, in order to be intellectually honest about this, it can't be completely terrible. There must be yeah. some redeeming qualities to this particular system. And I think it does have those re redeeming qualities. I think when you can create currency out of thin air in the form of a loan, it does give you the flexibility and the power to really organize human labor, human initiative, human energy in a mm -hmm. really quick and efficient way. Mm -hmm. um, I think the trouble though is somebody has to have their hand on the dial for how yeah. many of these silly things you're going to create in any, any one time. And uh, so I think there are two ways that it typically goes sideways in a fiat system. The first way, it, well, the way it always goes sour is, is uh, it's really tempting if you're the government and you want to get something done and you know that people, if you give them a green piece of paper, they'll just go and spend it. They don't, yeah. they're not counting the total number of green pieces of paper on the planet before they accept that one that you give them, right? Yeah. You're just going to take it and go spend it. So if you want to give something done, get something done, if you'd like to purchase votes, for example, <laughs> not to put too fine a point on it, you yeah. can do that. Yeah. And um, what happens is you, especially if you have your currency measured against some standard, like a particular number of ounces of gold, just pulling something out of thin air, uh, sometimes people wake up to realize, wait a minute, I, there's no way I could redeem $35 for an ounce of gold, for example. Right. You know, right. That's obviously a scam. Like you have obviously printed way more notes than can possibly be backed by all the gold on planet earth. That's Absolutely. one way things I think can go awry. People go, mm, this is not gold back. I'm losing my confidence in the, in this instrument. Mm -hmm. Um, I think people are mostly inured to that now. So, like we haven't, we haven't been on a gold standard like ever, but really officially when Nixon said, yeah, sorry guys, but we're closing the gold window. That was like 1971. Right. People in my generation, we never had a gold backed currency. It was just backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government, <laughs> such as it is. And um, I think the second way that things really go sideways with the fiat currency, and this is the, the worst way is when uh, the inflation occurs so quickly that people actually yeah. feel it and it becomes part of their economic calculus. Like I have to spend this money today before the things I need today are too expensive tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that's when the whole thing just blows up. So those are, those are, I think the really the, the two side effects um, yeah. of the one problem with fiat, which is it, there's no scarcity. You can print it as, as much as you want. Right. And so, okay. So coming back to the inflation point, you know, obviously we're sitting, I think last numbers that came out, what are 9.1, maybe it came down a tiny bit last time the Fed met um, here in the United States in terms of inflation, but that's not just 
that's not a local problem that's happening here. It's also happening globally. Like other currencies in other countries, their monetary system is starting to get a little shaky. And we're, we're seeing this happening worldwide. How do you see, I know you talked about inflation and, and the dollar not being valuable. So people are trying to spend it faster to get the goods that they need today because those goods are going to be higher. Yeah. What does that look like in, in like an ultimate collapse? Like, how do you see see the collapse happening just like a slow sliding you know like or is this going to be yeah i think over, i don't think there are really any instances of a currency just like riding off into the sunset right <laughs> they always they always implode it's always yeah. a disaster people are yeah. always wallpapering their home with the old defunct uh currency that just explodes because the currency that money is an agreement. There's nothing inherently valuable about, about gold. You can't eat right. it. It won't keep you warm. You can't burn right. it for warmth. I mean, right. broccoli is more valuable to you than gold is. Um, but we just agree to pretend that it's valuable. It has a nice property that it doesn't rust. But uh, when people say, oh, gold has had value for thousands of years, mm, people have given gold value because we have needed something of value to be the other side of every transaction. It's hard right. to trade one cow for 132 apples or whatever. So you have to have some medium in the middle. And what that amounts to is an agreement. Mm -hmm. You and I are both going to agree as if this blue, this green piece of paper means something. Mm -hmm. And so as long as we both agree, it works. But if you try to hand me a green piece of paper and I was like, whoa, keep that green piece of paper. Here's my wallet address. Let's do that right? Yes. Um, suddenly the agreement doesn't work anymore. So mm -hmm. when there's reason for people to doubt the, uh, the validity of the agreement, that's when the whole thing just falls apart. Because yeah. it seems to happen all at once. Right. So then how do you see, like with the crypto markets, obviously, <laughs> and I chuckle when I'm about to ask this question, there's a lot of like crazy psychoness in the crypto markets. You know, people are essentially kind of like what the US government is doing or the Federal Reserve is doing yeah. and printing a bunch of ones and zeros, you know, making yeah. quote unquote green paper, although 3% of our actual currency here in the United States is actually paper coin, paper and coins. The rest of it is all digital. We transact with our credit cards and so on. So there's craziness within the crypto markets where somebody, you and I can turn around and say, hey, Let's create this coin. We're going to do a big pump and dump, right? We're going to create a lot of hype around it. Is that it. a thing? Like, do people really do that? No, come on. <laughs> come on, Lars. <laughs> Who would they do that? Don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so obviously, like tokens in the crypto space are not yeah. created equal. And there's yeah. a lot of, a lot of um, pe people have a lot more faith in the currency, the Federal Reserve notes that are backed by the U.S. government than they do in this new way of transacting with Bitcoin and, and giving wallet addresses, like you mentioned. But where do you see the crypto market kind of fitting in like hmm. now and as we move into the future in terms of how the monetary system works um, yeah. globally, not even just in our uh, prospective countries? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I, I think about it like this. Um, crypto is not any more the same as, than people are the same. Like we have some things in mm -hmm. common, but we all, you know, we have our differences as well. I think the way that uh, the crypto world divides is that Bitcoin is money, full stop, and everything else is a security or hmm. some combination of a security and a commodity. Mm -hmm. So the security plus commodity would be like ETH, mm -hmm. where it, it powers uh, expensively these days, it powers some smart contracts and some stuff and some dApps. Um, and it's it's a bit of a security. You're hoping that the, the small number of humans in charge of the, the Ethereum project are gonna keep their wits about them and not screw everybody else on the go. Although I think they just have done with, uh, proof of stake. That's like, how do I make an instant oligarchy? Oh, go from proof of work to proof of stake. <laughs> um, but I think the reason that Bitcoin is, is different is because the entire world is watching. And if you want to pull a fast one, 
you got to get 51% of like a million plus nodes and miners. We all have right. to agree to let you screw us, mm -hmm. <laughs> basically. Yeah, yeah. Whereas the, uh, the, the small number of folks in charge of any of the other projects, they're more like uh, executives at a startup mm -hmm. and less like people doing anything revolutionary in terms of the way humans relate to the state, the state relates to the people in, involved in the way commerce is done. Um, it's a much easier way to invest in a new project, which is better and worse. Um, so that's, there's like Bitcoin and then everything else. Um, the third, I think third really important category is NFT, is NFT mm -hmm. land, where mm -hmm. now you can own an actual uh, non-copyable digital object. Mm -hmm. Whereas before you would just copy and paste whatever was of value and suddenly it's not valuable anymore because there's mm -hmm. no scarcity involved. We mm -hmm. don't, we don't transact in dirt or pine cones because they're everywhere. Right. So <laughs> if it's not scarce, it's not going to remain valuable. And NFTs give uh, the ability to preserve scarcity among digital assets. And so that I think is, uh, I mean, it's a huge tectonic shift yes. in digital pro like you can actually now own digital property and have digital capital in yes. a way that you couldn't have before so that's sort of how you know one knucklehead's view of, of the uh, cryptoverse <laughs> okay well, first off you said a lot there i kind of want to break down little pieces of it so going back to the actual crypto aspect and it was a really great response loved what you had to say in terms of bitcoin being a currency and the others um being securities or commodities kind of, you know, seen in in one way. And I was actually having a conversation. I just spoke at an event here in San Diego, Web3 Con, all about Web3 and talking about the different blockchains. And there's 861 different blockchains currently in the space. Now, are all 861 going to make it? No. Um, but the idea is, or not the idea, but the reality is, is beyond Bitcoin, those 860 left um, are essentially kind of centralized. So we, we hear a lot in the Web3 space that decentralized, 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 and we're going for that. But when you're talking about a small team, right, like the Ethereum team, yeah. we're almost putting our faith and our hope that, hey, they got their wits about them. They're not going to fly off the handle. They're going to hold it all together where Bitcoin can't fall apart because it has to be 51% of a million plus nodes, miners, and so on to decide collectively, hey, we're going to throw this off balance. But when you go into is it, and I still have a lot of faith and belief in some of these blockchains, because I think that they will eventually down the line start to what I like, uh, one of my other podcast co-pilots had used the term, we're decentralizing, we're not fully decentralized yet, we're decentralizing. So in the process of and I love that. And I and I do want to believe in, you know, wholeheartedly that some of these blockchains are going to be decentralizing, doing something like what Bitcoin is doing to be able to make it to where it is for the people, by the people. But when you talk about NFTs, NFTs are built on top of these blockchains. So mm -hmm. NFTs exist because of these blockchains, that the, the blockchain is the foundational piece. So even if we build an NFT project, and I know you're about to launch your own, so we're going to um, talk about that too, is let's say you launch a NFT project on the Ethereum blockchain. So you've built that NFT here and it allows you to have digital ownership. And some people are actually having like physical ownership of goods and digital aspects. So they have the physical and digital aspect with mm -hmm. that NFT. Yeah. But like how do you feel about those nft projects should the actual blockchain go south are you still pretty pretty okay with those nft projects being built on top of that um the short answer is no <laughs> okay because like you know I, i've been involved in businessy things for a long time mm -hmm. and i i know a lot of people involved in those things and they're people yes and we do goofy stuff sometimes <laughs> and we're subject to certain pressures at certain times. And, and also it's just hard to make a project go. It's, yeah. it's super hard to build something like that. What, the, what those major, uh, what the major uh, tokens have accomplished so far, it's nothing short of amazing. 
they're brilliant mm-hmm. and they're geniuses and um you know we should sing their praises to high heaven and they're also humans yeah so uh i do have a good deal of uh, i have a a healthy respect for the level of risk associated with building capital on a proprietary uh substrate such as mm-hmm. any of those centralized and they're I think the only decentralized blockchain in existence currently of any note and any scope is Bitcoin. Everything yeah, I else, agree with you. I mean, everything else is a is basically a company with a token. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. if the company goes south and you can't transact your NFT that you built on the company's token because the token doesn't exist anymore, what do you have really? Right. Who knows? But um, that doesn't, you know, I, there's not every company fails. Some companies become Amazon or Microsoft or absolutely or Facebook, Apple, right? and, exactly, yeah. Apple. And so uh, it's hard to know which will be which. If you had bet had to bet uh, on MySpace's chance, <laughs> circa two thousand and whatever, two thousand eight or nine, you would have spent. Oh yeah, this is going to be the thing. <laughs> this is going to make it. And then, like fourteen minutes later, it hadn't. It was gone. It was over. Yeah. So there's always that risk when it's a small number of people involved in the project. I think the mm-hmm. risk is significantly lower when you are truly decentralized. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Okay. So, so let's, I want you to first talk about your books, you as an author, how you got into doing that kind of work, uh, where that came from. And then let's talk about, cause you are talking about launching an NFT project based around one of your books or making a book and NFT. Yeah. And I'd like to hear about that project, but before, Tell us how how the whole authoring started. Yeah, so in the last, few, well, I had always, I had sort of always had uh, delusions of grandeur around writing <laughs> writing thriller novels uh, since I read my first Tom Clancy story, and I we had all these these different little plot lines, and they were all kind of interesting, but, mm-hmm. but when they came together, it was like pure magic. Like, oh my gosh, it's all all these weird intricate parts. They fit together in this really satisfying way for my nerd brain. And so I love that aspect about it. The second thing is that I love the idea that you're so many things are hidden in plain sight. You're looking at something that you perceive to be one thing and it is that, and it's also something else, very different. Mm. And mm-hmm. so those, those, uh, those two ideas are really intriguing to me. And since I had, well, I've done the bulk of my writing since I became involved in the Bitcoin project as a, as a miner and investor. And so blockchain and Bitcoin, it's a theme in a lot of my books. In fact, there's a, I wrote three books, the Devolution uh, Trilogy, that explores one way that a, that a currency can collapse. And then what are some of the implications and what are some interesting scenarios that might, that might happen uh, as a result of that happening? It's one take. Um, you know, of course, it could happen a million different ways, but it's really worth thinking about. And it's yeah. worth preparing for, I think. And um, as soon as I became aware that you could do more than monkey pictures with NFTs, <laughs> I became <laughs> interested. Take nothing away from those guys. It's completely awesome what they've done. Oh, my gosh. But how many, I mean, how, how many different ways can you interact with your monkey picture, right? <laughs> like, there it is. Ah. Uh, he still looks the same as yesterday. Lars, it's a it's a status symbol right now. At this point, they've built it to a to a, a level where it's yeah. almost like somebody you know walking around with their Gucci bag, right? Yeah. It's like it's a status symbol that you have a board ape. It's not even the board ape itself. It's I have one of those. <laughs> totally. Yeah, I I totally get it. I'm yeah. I'm completely on board and I'm ecstatic for them. The, they um, <laughs> I don't I forgot what podcast those guys were on. Maybe it's how I built this recently. Okay. Um, well worth a listen. Awesome dudes, it seems like, and a really I'll cool project. Yeah. But I, I listening to it, I always and watching this sort of progress, I've always had the sense that oh, there's got to be something like with a little more utility associated yeah. with it. And so there's a way now that you can mint unique copies of a novel, for example, and you can sell individual covers. So you have your unique one of a kind in the universe copy of a best selling novel. And yeah. um, it's a possession that you can hold and will hopefully increase in value as the as that 
ecosystem improves and in, increases. And so, and then not only can you just look at the cover, you can actually read the book. So yeah. that's a cool application, I think, and a cool way to, um, it, it's a cool way to have something that you own that will yeah. hopefully increase in value, but that you can also interact with, you know? So I, I, I'm in love with the idea. Uh, these are minted on the Cardano block. And I'm working with some folks at a project called book.io. Okay. And, um, it's a, a friend of mine, just, he writes in like the urban fantasy and sci-fi uh, genre. So it lends uh -huh. itself more to the kind of nerds like us who are into crypto than <laughs> mine. But he uh, had, he minted 3,000 copies, tw 2,700 and something copies, of which 120 were unique, uniquely yeah. designed covers. And he sold out in 45 seconds, 45 seconds. Wow. So there's something there, I think. Yes. And, oh, yes. And so yeah, I'm like, hey, I, I'm... can we get mine out? Can we get mine out now? <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's so awesome. Yeah. I love that. So he did that through Book.io. Uh, yeah. So is that you're doing your project through Book.io? I am, yep. Is, and then Book.io does all of their NFT projects on Cardano. They do this current one, yeah. Okay. And that's, I think, mainly just because ETH has priced itself out of the market for many of those kind of items, you know, so. I don't know. If it's proof of stake now, shouldn't it be cheaper? Shouldn't it be cheaper? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Very cool. That's so exciting. I love that. Um, not only I'm a huge avid book reader. I will have to be honest with you though and tell you a lot of the books I read are nonfiction. Um, I do need to get more, and I have had this awareness with myself because I always have a book and a highlighter, you know, mm. I'm like going through it. But I'm like, you know what? I really like need to give my mind a break sometimes and actually read storybooks. Uh, yeah. I used to do a lot of storybooks when I was younger. Uh, but I, I've definitely been more in, into the nonfiction type mm -hmm. things. But it's very cool because I know, you know, I have a lot of patients in my office. I have a lot of friends who read books on Kindle uh, and they're doing a lot of ebooks or audiobooks. And I think having the ability not only to own your own unique book cover as the NFT, like actually hold the NFT, but you now also get the purchase of the book like an electronic copy of it to where you're almost being able to read it, I would imagine on something very similar to like a Kindle or. Yeah. Like eventually. Eventually. eventually I think not it, right now, ours. <laughs> it's not that way now. No, there's not like okay. a, there's not like an okay. NFT wallet uh, e-reader. It's actually okay. surprisingly difficult to make an e-reader. Okay. Either. I mean, you would have thought we have hardware on Mars for Pete's sake. Why would it be hard to make, <laughs> but it is, it's hard to make an e-reader that people like or, or an app that people like. Yeah. And, uh, and it's hard to link that with the blockchain. So for the moment you can read it on a, on a web application at book.io in the future though, you, you will be able to read your only your copy and it does, it does connect with your wallet so that yeah, uh, like the, one of the issues with uh, music as an FT for the moment, the way it's implemented is that, you can technically own it, but everybody else on earth still gets to listen to the song. So yeah. is it really yours? Uh, I mean, maybe, I don't know. It's like a collector's edition of the album, right? It's a little right. more valuable, but but there's not nearly the kind of scarcity that, um, well, an album now would be quite scarce since there's you know, <laughs> everything is, is digital, but uh, maybe not quite the same level of, of scarcity that you can get with an actual, uh, with a book. Right. Well, I mean, we de we definitely are, and this is something I say pretty much every single episode. We're very early on in this space, yeah. so things are very clunky. Um, you know, it's like when computers, personal computers first came out, they were like the size of, you know, your kitchen. You know, you had this big, huge monitor and this big, huge computer sitting around, and now things obviously have shrunk, you know, as technology has gotten better. So based on what you're saying there, like, you know, yeah, you can read it on, <clears throat> excuse me, you can read it on an app, but it's not as easily accessible or it's easy to do. Uh, that's not going to be the case forever. Uh, for those of you who are listening that are very new to this space and may feel like you've missed the boat, that's not what Lars is saying. We're very, very early on. <laughs> yeah, very early so. days. In fact, at the moment, it's, um, you know, the, the people who would buy NFTs from an author are generally fans of the author. Yeah. Um, you know, for, usually to start with, but maybe also folks who are excited about the economic potential of the of the medium and of having of having assets that are 
that are scarce and that will in increase in value over time. Ideally. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's a lot to be said. Like, I mean, this is just kind of where my mind went, just as you were saying that too, because I know a lot of authors will do like book tours. You know, they have a new book come out and they'll go to tour different cities and be in different um, bookstores. And, you know, people will come out and be able to like have the Q&A with the author, get their book signed. I mean, how cool would it be? Like, you know, either A, you you show up to those and you get your own personalized NFT. So, you know, mm -hmm. now you're interacting with the blockchain or you can only go to the book tour. You can only show up. Your ticket into the event is an mm -hmm. actual NFT, maybe yeah. like a special collectible for that city, like Oh, you know, Lars is in Coeur d'Alene and Coeur d'Alene, this is their specific, they get a little bookmark, like a digital bookmark for showing up at that event. Mm. I don't know. I mean, the, the opportunities and the things that can be created is so endless, like, and how um, people can, in, can source that sense of community, not only from the creator side, but also as a person who's, you know, following that creator. You totally have my gears turning now, ma'am. That's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> All right, yeah, you heard yeah. it first, Dr. Brooke on the block. <laughs> Lars got it. <laughs> That's right. You heard it first. This is, where, this is where my brain works. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> no, that's, that's an awesome idea. Yeah, of course. All right, Lars, is there anything else you would like to share with the audience base uh, before we pull the ride into the station? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go visit me at Lars.buzz. Whatever the best deal of the moment is when you visit, that's where it will be found, Lars.buzz. Mm. And nice. uh, when you when it comes time for the NFT to be issued, um, I hope it sells out in 44 seconds instead <laughs> of 45. So I could say I beat you by a second. One but if second. there's any left, that's where you'll find it. Yeah, that's that'll be the gateway to that as well. So Lars.buzz, if you if anything sounded interesting, if you're into thrillers, uh, if you, if you're into uh, a few ideas about what may evolve over time with the relationship between crypto and fiat um you might enjoy them yeah definitely and i'll be sure to link all of that in the show notes just to you know get the friction to entry out of there where you could just click the link what lars said and get exactly uh where you need to go so thank you so much lars for being here i really appreciate your time today and for those of you who are new here i always tell you guys make sure you keep your arms and legs in the ride do not try to get out before we pull up into the station and as we and this for today, have a beautiful rest of your Thursday and we will chat soon. You made it. Congratulations. That wasn't so bad, was it? I hope you laughed and learned a little bit more about this Web3 universe and how simple and fun it can really be. Would you be so kind as to leave us a review and share it with your friends and family? It would mean so much to get this out to more people as we embark on the greatest transfer of wealth that has ever happened in human history. Can't wait to see you on the next one.